Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Raw Men. This is a uh, live podcast, episode number 39, I believe it is. And uh, this time around, Mark, uh, my co-host, is not able to join me. He's off gallivanting and doing busy stuff. Uh, and I'm going to be interviewing Ms. Robin Blumner, who is the executive director of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. We've met each, met each other a number of times, different conferences and such. I found her a very interesting person and it had to have her on the show at some point. And this was the best opportunity we could arrange to do that. How are you doing, Robin? I'm wonderful, Aaron. Thank you for having me on. And let me just correct one thing. I am the president and CEO of the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, soon to become the CEO of the Center for Inquiry starting Monday. That's huge news. Tell me about that. It How is. did that happen? It's very exciting. Um, this has been a, a post I've, I've been interviewing for for close to six months. Um, they did a national search for a new leader, and uh, it was a uh, very stiff competition. I'm absolutely thrilled to have been uh, chosen for the job of trying to fill the very big shoes of Ron Lindsay. And uh, even more exciting is that we're bringing the Richard Dawkins Foundation along. So uh, RDF will be considered a division of the Center for Inqu Inquiry. We are maintaining, the, the Richard Dawkins Foundation is maintaining its identity its programming, its staff. So it's it's just uh, the idea that our organizations have very similar missions and there will be great synergies by combining the two. What do you see as, I, I'm guessing by what you're saying that there's not gonna be a significant change on the part of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, but what about what about this new avenue? What, what's well, the change there? Well, what it really means is that we're bringing more resources, more people power, and more uh, sort of institutional credibility, if you will, to the Richard Dawkins Foundation. And the Center for Inquiry is going to get the entrepreneurial spirit of the Richard Dawkins Foundation, some of the youth. You know, we have 1.5 million hits a month on our website. Um, we have a terrific social media presence. Um, so the Richard Dawkins Foundation is going to bring all of that creative energy to CFI, which has a, uh, quite a bit of creative, creative energy itself. But a lot of it is in, you know, the publications that it puts out, some of the outreach work that it does, and not quite as much online work as uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation does. So I think it's going to be an incredible marriage. Uh, that will mind. enhance the work of both. Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, I mean, I, I have some familiarity for, with CFI through some of the conferences that they host, but what else uh, What else do they do? Well, they, they put out two important academic magazines, uh, Free Inquiry and Skeptical Inquirer. Uh, so the organization is devoted to uh, a, a, a tens of thousands subscriber ba base um, they have a lawyer and a lobbyist. Um, the lawyer has, does important church state related cases and has, for instance, uh, just filed a brief in the case that's coming up for oral argument in March involving the regulations on Texas abortion clinics. And the Richard Dawkins Foundation, in fact, joined that brief um, it's a great brief because it includes not only our two organizations, but 40 individual scientists. And it's an amicus brief that's focused specifically on undercutting the science arguments, the medical science arguments that were used to justify these punishing and onerous regulations on abortion clinics in Texas. These regulations are so restrictive that half of abortion clinics have already closed in Texas, and it's expected that only 10 may remain standing in the whole state uh, if these regulations are allowed to stand. And they were justified as essential for safety for women, which is you know complete bunk. And so uh, a group of eminent scientists, including Richard Dawkins, and a group of eminent 
organizations that speak for scientists, including CFI and the Richard Dawkins Foundation, have filed a brief in the U.S. Supreme Court. So the, a lot of that writing was done by the lawyer for CFI, Nick Little. Um, it also had a lobbyist, and the lobbyist recently submitted wonderful, a wonderful set of objections to the Federal Trade Commission on homeopathic medicine. And it basically urged the FTC to start regulating homeopathy in the same way that it regulates other types of medicine, which is to require that claims of safety and efficacy are realized, you know, not just to go by these general uh, boasts by homeopathic practitioners and by uh, drug companies, instead to actually require the kind of rigorous testing that typical pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals have to go through. Now, you, you brought uh, so, up a number of things that, I, that I'm going to want to talk about. I mean, first of all, okay. you, you don't have to tell me anything about how corrupt the, polit the pol political situation in Texas is, as I'm a Texas resident and have been an activist against a lot of these, uh, a lot of these people uh, that are behind all this for, for many years. And we never make any headway. And uh, there is a couple of legal cases that I would love to discuss with you about your a lawyer after the show, because there's some things okay. that, that, that there, there's definitely some back burner stuff that needs to be dealt with there. But for the meantime, you mentioned about the, the uh, demanding uh, some kind of regulation on the efficacy of homeopathic medicine. That's that's outstanding for me because there was a hospital, and you may be aware of this, there was a hospital in operation in, in London or in England that was a homeopathic hospital. How do, you, how do you run a hospital on something that has no function i mean how how, did, how does that work this hospital ran for years and i couldn't figure out how the hell does this happen is it, is it, it are these people getting the kinds of remedies that 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 i don't know that that herb herbalists would give in in you know some third world age of centuries ago what kind of treatment are these people getting that how could you run a hospital on homeopathic medicine it, it's, it's a mystery to me so i would love well, to see yeah, there's there, there's been um, studies done which looked at whether homeopathic medicine was effective, and what they found again and again is that it's no more effective than a placebo effect. So you you have um, snake oil being sold to patients, which may not necessarily harm them in the in the sense that this treatment, so quote unquote won't harm them. But the fact that they are pursuing that avenue for their health care rather than science-based medical, science-based medicine, means that they could very well be exacerbating um, whatever affliction they have. And it, it's, uh, it's a fraud. It's a fraud on the consuming public and ultimately a dangerous one. And that's why we have regulatory agencies like the Food and Drug Administration and the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission is supposed to prevent companies from making claims that are patently untrue. Exactly. So, so the, um, the, the comments submitted by the Center for Inquiry and uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation joined them, asked the FTC to do its job and start insisting that if claims of uh, medical efficacy are made, that they'd be proven out. And of course, they're not gonna be able to do so. So, I mean, you have a really um, well-funded and organized homeopathic uh, industry that is fighting back tooth and nail. So of course, and why, why sometimes the forces of reasons in science don't succeed. Yeah, well, you've got such a racket there, don't you? I mean, if it's only water, then it's how, water. how easy it is how easy it is to to make a profit off of something like that using the means that they do. It's it's all marketing, right? It's all yeah. just uh, making claims that they can't bear out, that don't bear out, and that they can't prove. Do you remember it's, when? It's really disgraceful. You remember when James Randi famously took that overdose on homeopathic medicine? There was a, there was a warning on the bottle that you're only supposed to take this much, so he drank the entire bottle? 
you know, and something like 83 years of, of age and, and laughing at the, because we know that homeopathy is nonsense. How do they run a hospital on that? That's a complete mystery to me. And I had something, I had something else I was going to mention about that and I uh, lost it. <laughs> well, you had asked me what CFI does. So I wanted to give you some of the uh, nuts and bolts of the work of the organization. Incredibly important. It also helps to uh, provide funding for um, atheist and secular bloggers around the world who are in hiding or are trying to get uh, to, trying to escape violence. Uh, there are a number of, of bloggers uh, who are basically under its witness protection program, if you will, and are are being given regular stipends uh, to keep them safe. So uh, the organization has um, branches around the country, there are and and affiliates around the world. It's a, it's a huge organization. It's got over forty employees. Uh, budget of five million dollars a year and the I can't uh, tell you how excited I am to work with this team of people who are doing incredibly important work that is that does sound to me I mean having some familiarity with with CFI and all of that it, it, it does sound like huge that, that this would be happening now and that you would be in charge of it I mean how did you walk into that <laughs> I'm, I'm very lucky person, and uh, I've, I've, you know, always done work that has been incredibly fulfilling. Um, not everyone can say that about the jobs they've ended up in in their lives, but you know, it's, I've made it happen. I, I and part of it is that I've never um, followed the money. You know, I've I've followed. The passion. Some, I've followed my the passion, my fulfillment. I've followed my um, my intellect, and not traded it for the dollars that would come. No. And as a result, you know, you, you, I'm not a rich person. I'm decidedly mi middle class. But boy, what a life I've had, and will be having as head of CFI. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm certainly not a rich person either, but I'm I'm really happy with what I'm doing right now. I can't say that about my previous jobs, to be sure. But when we were talking before before I hit the record button or the broadcast button on this show, you had mentioned something about your distant past as a journalist, and I'd, I'd really like for you to, to express that again. Right, it was not so distant. Um, I became head of the Richard Dawkins Foundation in February of 2014. So it's, it's only coming on two years. Uh, I was, before that, a uh, opinion writer. I was a columnist and editorial writer at the Tampa Bay Times newspaper in Florida. Tampa Bay Times had previously uh, run under the, uh, under the title St. Petersburg Times and then changed its name to appear a little more World, worldly, lar larger, more regional than just St. Petersburg, Florida. But it's actually the largest circulation newspaper in the state of Florida. Uh, I was a nationally syndicated by Tribune Media Services, so my columns appeared in newspapers around the country. I would write a weekly column and then four editorials a week in addition to that. And I did that for 16 years. Um, and prior to that, I was, I headed up the American Civil Liberties Union for the state of Florida. Outstanding. And, yes, it was a fantastic job. Um, and before that, I was the ACLU director in Utah. So in imagine, Utah. <laughs> <laughs> imagine uh, having There's a, a job. There's a small cultural you're up difference. In, There's a small cultural yeah. difference between Utah. Well, and, Florida. and I'm from New York. I'm from, from New York. And the, <laughs> you know, when I was in Utah, they, um, they, my formal title was executive director of the ACLU. But I, but I answered to that godless communist ACLU girl all the time. That was, you know, hey, there's that godless girl. I'm like, yeah, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, I, so I started my career after law school um, as a progressive advocate and nonprofit administrator, and then went into journalism as a way to promote the ideas and ideals uh, that were 
deepest concern. And I did that for a very long time until it became quite apparent to me, sadly, that print journalism was not going to survive my professional life. That I had a, still a long career ahead of me and newspapers didn't have a long life ahead of them. And so I, I went back to my community in the progressive world and I said, I think I'm gonna come back in. Let's see what's out there. And it just so happens that about that time, uh, Richard Dawkins was looking for someone to come on in and take, take the helm of his foundation. And lucky me, I mean, I'd been an atheist my whole life and I'd been a fan of Richard's. I'd read his books, not only his God delusion books, but his, um, some of his evolutionary biology books, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the idea of getting to work with him and for him was pretty much a dream come true. And, and really that's what, what it's been. When I mentioned, or when, before we hit the broadcast button, you know, we, we, we did this dangerous thing where we have a couple of minutes of small talk and accidentally uh, hit gold a couple of times. And I wanted to, to kind of re remind you of some of the things you'd said in, in that before interview. Uh, I was telling you that last week I was in uh, the United Arab Emirates, where I didn't tell you that, uh, that, that one of the, the hosts that, that brought me in there was uh, familiar with some people in the royal family and wanted to introduce me. And I declined because there's, I, I, I didn't see a point in meeting people if I can't do anything or say anything that might affect change, which realistically I could not. Uh, however, uh, you then followed that up by, by telling me about being uh, in, in, in much more in Saudi Arabia, yeah, in a much more prestigious uh, position than I ever will be. Tell me about well, that. Well, part of being a journalist uh, is that you get to meet people you wouldn't normally meet and interact with uh, cultures that uh, other otherwise you'd have to, you know, engage as a tourist. And I got to go to Saudi Arabia as a professional, as a journalist, and meet with then Crown Prince Abdullah in his palace in Jeddah. Um, I was in Riyadh and Jeddah. Uh, it was absolutely fascinating. Of course, Crown Prince Abdullah became King Abdullah and now he's deceased. But I was there in 2002, which was a very interesting time to be in Saudi Arabia. First of all, it's one of the scarier places on earth to be a woman. Um, they practice gender apartheid which was really shocking to see writ large. You would buy, you would go past a, a bank and you would see a little building right next to the larger bank and it would be called the ladies annex because women were not allowed to interact with male clerks. So there had to be an entire female workforce employed just to handle the commerce that women had. Um, you, you would walk down the street, women would be completely covered in burqas. They would only be allowed to, to be in public if they were with a male relative. Uh, obviously women in Saudi Arabia could not drive. Uh, with, they, they had drivers, most of them, at least the ones I interacted with, because you know it's a very wealthy country and so most of those women came from some money and could have that resource. But it was, really frightening to see this what was what's essentially a Bedouin culture with the veneer of modernity. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia won the world lottery. It found itself on the largest reserves of oil just when the entire world became insatiably thirsty for it. And so it got rich very fast without having to do what other countries have to do to get rich, which is to exploit their entire human capital, educate their workforce, to um, adjust their culture to economic realities. None of that happened in Saudi Arabia. And as a result, you have this, this culture stuck in, in an ancient people's times and yet, you know, gleaming towers of offices with no women's rooms in them. I was in the Chamber of Commerce building in Saudi Arabia. There was no place I could go to the bathroom. There, it, it just simply was irrelevant. Women wouldn't be in that building. So 
it was a it was a very bizarre place. I was I stayed at the Crown Plaza Hotel, and when I went to the pool, it said no women allowed. When I went to the dining hall to eat, women and men had to be separate and eat separately. If there were families dining together, men and women together, they had to do so behind a curtain. I mean, it was just completely bizarre. Even, even for a family, I mean, this is one of the things that I, that I thought was bizarre about Dubai, which is like the shining star of progressive, you know, it's the most progressive part of the Arab world. But I, I very often saw men in complete distinction from women, even there. Yeah. Even in yeah. some things like 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 going out camping or 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 whatever. I mean, barbecue in the in the desert. I mean, they they didn't bring their women along, and I was confused about that. I mean, why do they have this division? I think it goes back to some ancient taboos about um, men and women mixing. I, Honestly, I, I'd, I'd have to be a historian to, to tell you. <laughs> I, I've got, uh, I guess I meant that as a rhetorical question, but yeah, when I when I when I was in India was the the one of the more bizarre uh, moments of the, the cover up that I'd ever seen. I mean, I'd seen the burkas and all of that, and I'd seen the things where there's a, just a full veil where you can't even see where it's just black, you know. But the the one that disturbed me the most in in India there was this one very pompous uh, kind of guy who had. A collection of women that I, I guess were all his property, and they had a uh, multicolored uh, equivalent of a burqa, and they all had this opening only on one side, so that you could only see one <laughs> eye. And it, it, it's like they're hiding, and it was a, it was it was a very disturbing thing to see. But you know when they, when they turn their head so, and you just see that one eye peeking at you. I'm like, What's up with that? It, it seems to me, from the outside perspective, having no idea what I'm looking at, it just it seems so very oppressive, like like every part of the female form at every age is, is somehow vile and disgusting and must be covered up. It it's it's difficult for me to relate to from you know coming from a Western perspective. As I as I said, I mean I, I don't have a problem in in viewing women like that. You know I, I grew up in Los Angeles. I got this down. Um, it's hard for me to imagine being in a society where you have to for whatever reason. Anyway. I, it's I, not I, the first time that women suffered restrictions as a consequence of male lust. And that's what I think this is, is women are by their nature temptations. And so they're the ones who get punished for that. It's the, it's the Eve in all women, right? Yeah. And, uh, and we're, we're paying the consequences. Now, when, uh, I, when I was into Biden, luckily, was yeah. It was the, the, this famous incident of a, of a Scandinavian woman who was who was raped and then uh, she's judged against because she was the victim of the rape because you can't accuse someone of sexual infidelity if you don't have multiple witnesses. And when do you ever have multiple witnesses for a sex crime like that, right? And and so I remember at the, there was a, one of the rulers had actually apologized on national TV or whatever, saying that you know, the, the mistakes were made and we are a young country. There, there are people that are trying to move their culture into modernity, but because of the religious restrictions in which all of the Arab world is based, there's a hindrance that's going to impede progress. If you rely on Sharia law, then women's testimony is only worth half that of a man's in a criminal trial, which yeah, means and, that a woman's uh, claims of, of criminal violation w won't, won't withstand cross-examination if, if a man is claiming otherwise. You know, somebody just gave me a copy of the Quran, and I, I finally started making an effort to read the Quran. I read the first couple chapters so far, and and, and a couple of days ago, I, I read the bit where you have to call in two, you know, two male witnesses uh, for some matter that you need to have witnesses for. And they said, if you can't find two men, then get one man and two women. And that way, if one of the women forgets, the other one can remind her. <laughs> Yeah, like this. This only happens with 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 women, right? This all. This is what you can expect with women. This wouldn't happen with a man. You know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this changing. is this is the problem. Look, it wasn't that long ago that Western 
that the Western legal system also discounted women's testimony. It wasn't very long ago that women in the Western world were considered property of their husbands. It wasn't long ago that in the Western world that women could, did, didn't have credit. They had to get their credit card through their husband, that women couldn't inherit property. All these things existed up until you know fairly recently. I mean, we're talking about a hundred years. Somewhere but between the went, somewhere between one and two centuries ago, a woman could not legally own a business in the United States. Right, a woman couldn't be a lawyer. A woman couldn't, you know, go to medical school. I mean, there were all sorts of restrictions on women in the professional world. Women, there were a series of of labor laws targeting women, saying women couldn't carry over a certain amount of weight, you know, they could, which, which ensured that they didn't get certain kinds of jobs. And they were, it was the, the stack, the, the stacks against women were, were, were as high as you can imagine. They were as high as they were anywhere in the world. But the great thing about a legal system based on human law is that it can evolve over time when when standards and culture change and become more progressive and more tolerant and accepting, the law can then follow suit. But when, you're, when you ground your legal system in religion, a text that is ostensibly handed down from the divine, then it can't shift as mores do. And that's the problem, that is the conundrum of the Islamic world right now. See, in Dubai, uh, they, they've tried to minimize the use of Sharia law. and yet they, they have it for very few applications. So I was talking to a cop down there that said that they use Sharia law for almost nothing in Dubai anymore. Uh, divorce court and things like that is it the only things that, that, that apply anymore. But that, that there are some laws that are, that are archaic and can't be challenged because they're, they come direct from the Quran and, and the scriptures can't be questioned. And so that creates a problem. If you've got, like what we were talking about, you know, the accusation of rape and so forth, if you, you can't address that because it's written into the scripture and the scripture can't be corrected because that would be an admission of error, well, then how do you progress? Exactly. That, that's exactly my point. And it's ultimately, you're going to have to ignore aspects of religion to become a modern society. There's no way around it. And every Christian base country, which would not include the United States for anyone who's listening, has had to essentially ignore Christian doctrine in order to give women rights, to give um, same-sex couples rights. They've, they've just moved on from their religion um, and allowed it to exist in a smaller and smaller sphere of life. Which brings me to the next thing I wanted to ask you about. I mean, you said that you were an atheist your whole life. Right. And now, to my experience, the most outspoken activists or, you know, anti, you know, anti theists, at least, uh, are all former believers, uh, much like the, the most outspoken anti smokers are former smokers, the same kind of thing. But you were you were an atheist forever. So how did you become the activist that you are now? I spent a lot of years uh, doing church state. Uh, litigation. I was not actually the, the lawyer on these cases, but I was there as executive director in Utah and executive director of the ACLU in Florida. And so I saw the danger of the uh, encroaching religion into the public sphere, whether it be the operation of law, whether it be science. And so I've always had real zeal to cabin religion to its proper place, which is you know, a private decision that individuals make to you know, believe a certain doctrine, but that, that, it, that once it starts to seep into public policy, it's extremely dangerous. And we, of course, we see that all, it, all over the place. We see it with you know, abortion rights and birth control and same-sex marriage and stem cell research and whether evolution gets taught in school and climate change. I mean, just one after the next public policy that's influenced by religious extremism trying to exert its influence in law. 
So those things have those things really energized me. Now, you know, I think that the secular world is in, on the ascendancy in this country. We have the wind at our back. We are we're the, the leading edge of the progressive movement, and our numbers are growing. It's very it's a very exciting time to be part of this movement, and I see it having huge implications for the kinds of public policy that I want to see implemented. So uh, it, I, for me, it was kind of a no-brainer to go into the, the secular world. I see it as really um, the, the voice of the people who have sloughed off an old mythology and are looking for a, a, a secular future. Um, you know, I, the same way I wouldn't probably have been an activist were it not for the fact that I live in Texas. And and the things that Texas does are so reprehensible. You, know, you mentioned about you know, eliminating all of the birth control centers. And of course, the backup story on that, we had uh, you know Wendy Davis who did this like 11 and a half hour mm -hmm. filibuster with a catheter. Right so that she could maintain so that she could get so that she could get that that window pushed over the midnight hour and thus stop that loss of the closing of the session and so what do they do uh, our, our lieutenant governor at that point in front of unbeknownst to him 180,000 online witnesses watching over the internet cameras he fudged the dates on the document to say that it was still done on time and it took 3 hours to explain to that guy that he can't get away with that because of the 180,000 witnesses that had already screenshotted what was going on. So th these people think they're untouchable. And in fact, this guy has never gone up on charges. Why not? You're falsifying documents. And everybody's got you dead to rights that that's what you did. But no, this isn't going to happen to these people. So they can corrupt and whatever they want. And they can push whatever they want. And it doesn't seem to matter. They can ignore the Constitution, however they will. They, they have Texas legislators have believed that they have two different laws that they can write. They need to, to write one set of laws that will promote Christianity and another separate set of laws that will protect against Sharia law. Now, you can point out that they already have that protection written into the federal law if they would just respect that, but they, they don't because they want to make sure that they promote Christianity. And so they can't have a secular government. And so they have to change our history books so that, you know, everything in the history books now, it's not just the science books. It's not just sex education, which is abstinence only in Texas. It's, it's every avenue. They want to, they want to uh, promote right-wing Christian conservative values. Values, I use, you know, with quotation marks. They have uh, changed several things in the history books so that it seems like only white people have ever done anything important. They've removed all these ethnic references. And it's kind of insidious the way they've uh, made Moses a historic character, for example. And how they've changed references, like a, in one case there was a mention of hip hop music. Well, they changed that to country western because everything needed to be white. It, it's kind of alarming when you look at it on the big picture. They're living here in Texas as an activist. I mean, it's 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 hard not to be when you open your eyes and look at what they're doing. I only wish more people felt the way you did. If if everyone who had the impulse to you know ra raise a fist against what Texas is doing. If every that every person who had that feeling got involved, then we wouldn't have a problem in this country. We would look a lot more like Bernie Sanders, Vermont, <laughs> than than the than Ted Cruz's Texas. That's for sure. I got to tell you that the way that we got this uh, fundamentalist governor that we currently have uh, was a, in, in a record low voter turnout. And this was a very disturbing thing for me because we're always arguing against people who say, well, it's a broken system and it, it's better to, the best action is to take no action. I don't get that. How do they not understand that? And every time that there's a low voter turnout, the Republican right wing Christian conservatives are voting exactly the way their church tells them to do. So they always get the edge when what when who would represent the, the, uh, the, the more progressive side refuse to take a stand and, and to vote. So I, I don't get where they get this this attitude from. I realize there's a lot of anarchists out there. I realize there's a lot of people that are dissatisfied with the American system, but there's a way to fix it. And inaction is not a form of action and hasn't yet ever got us anything good. It's always gotten us into a worse situation. 
When I was a columnist, one of the columns I wrote was around the time that uh, college students were graduating. So I, I wrote a, a graduation speech, what I would tell the class of, you know, 20, 2020, um, if, if I was giving one of the commencement addresses. And uh, it, it really just came down to this, vote. Vote, vote, vote. Every time you have an opportunity to vote, do so. Because that is your power, that is your obligation as a citizen. You, I hope you're informed when you do so. I hope you've bothered to read a, local, a, a regular paper or kept up with the news. But, you know, this country doesn't ask a lot of you. It asks you to do some services as a juror occasionally, mm -hmm. and it asks you to participate in the democracy. It's a gift. People around the world have died for this right of self-determination. Use it, use your franchise. And uh, I, you know, I just don't understand why there's this drop off in voter participation for the young. You would think that that's, ex that's the time that people wanna be most involved and most engaged. You know, that's when you, you come into a, the political system in America with with energy and with enthusiasm and a little idealism, let's hope, when you're young. Well, so those, why people not that vote? Say that, those people that say that their vote doesn't count, you know, that their one vote doesn't count, well, if you get 10,000, 50,000 people to say that, yeah, well, they're right. They're, those 50,000 votes ended up counting against them. And it, it, it made a huge difference in our last gubernatorial uh, election. And, and well, in other words, I was from Florida for years. I was in Florida during the 2000 election. You know, I watched. Uh, so you can tell me what a hanging Chad is, because I was. <laughs> <laughs> and a pregnant one, yes, I can sadly <laughs> tell you. Uh, it was unbelievable when you had six million votes, and that, and the election came down to five hundred and thirty-seven votes. So you essentially had a tie. Ralph Nader won 90,000 votes that year. Had he not been what I consider the spoiler for the Democrats, we would have had Al Gore as president. We would not have had a war in Iraq. We would not have the, the, the punishing debt that George Bush created. I mean, if, just think of all the things that flowed from the George Bush presidency. We would not have Guantanamo. We would not have had torture. We would not have had Dick Cheney. Um, all those things happened. I'm not blaming Ralph Nader. I'm blaming, <laughs> I'm blaming the people who didn't vote. But I'm just saying that if, if anyone who says their vote doesn't count just needs to look at the race in Florida for electoral votes. Well, another thing that they need to look at, I know that there's already people that are, that are as they hear this, they're going to be wanting to type in their in the messages that, you know, how they're, apathetic position on this but if voting didn't count if your vote didn't count then why would the the gop christian conservative republican religious right be gerrymandering everything to try to minimize the possibility of anybody's vote against them why would that be such an issue why would they be trying to close uh, close ballots why would they be trying to to do everything that they could to minimize the opposition's influence in the voting process, if your vote didn't count, this is proof that it clearly does count. So I, I'm yelling at you as if you were those people that so irritate me when they say, "Oh, it's a broken system." I don't want to. And no, what, what what bothers me even more than that, and is this idea that you conflate the two parties, you know, and you say, "Well, they're they're all the same. They're all a corrupt group of of corporate lackeys." I assure you that elections have consequences and who's leading this nation who's choosing our supreme court supreme court justices will have huge implications for you and your children they, this is they're, they're, you know our freedoms right now are hanging in the balance based on what just justice kennedy thinks we have a we have a, 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 a the texas abortion case is coming before the court i think it's march 2nd it all comes down to what Justice Kennedy thinks. It's like it's his world, we just live in it. And he's got the, he's got 
women's destinies in the, in his hand. You know, there's a one of the briefs that were filed was fi were filed by 113 women lawyers who said we all had abortions. And the reason that we are successful professionals today is because that right exists and it existed for us. Had we had to have that, the, the baby we were carrying, we would not have had these careers. So, so you had the, the, this video made against Planned Parenthood, right? It, it was a hoax video. And then you had, you had a, a Celia, I, I can't remember her name now. Carly Fiorina. And no, no, no. Cecilia Richards. Cecile Richards, yeah. who you know, you know, she's the daughter of Ann Richards. Yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Texas governor. Right. So they have her on stand, and and the the, the guy who's who's giving the, the 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 prosecution against her in this case, and I, uh, mentions that he got this information direct from her website, but he forgot to take off the the real location where it came from. So I mean, he's getting it from fraudulent sources, and they have they have a falsified video. Everything about their attack on Planned Parenthood is fake. And from what I understand, that they're, they're, the people who made the original video are now going to be up on charge. Or they're now being indicted, I believe. But what about this other guy that, 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 that claims during the, the court case that he got this direct from their website when he clearly did not, when he clearly got it from a different propaganda source? Why are they not up on charges? Again, these people are untouchable. They can do whatever the hell they want. They don't face charges like we, we regular people would. Are you talking about the congressional inquirers? Are you talking about the the... the Congressional hearing, so. well, you know, they have immunity. Well, as, as do our governor and lieutenant governor. Well, maybe not our governor, because our governor is had, had eventually been told that, yes, he's going to be going up on charges on abuse, of abuse of power. And after he had been governor for 10 years, I had to wonder, why did you wait this long before putting him up on these charges? Because we've got so many other incidents that have happened in the distant past that he was directly involved with. That's a that's a story for another time. I didn't bring you on to talk about Texas politics. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know where the conversation is going to lead. These are all, but but the important thing is actually the these issues all emanate from one source, which is that religious extreme extremism, when it finds its way into law, has uh, highly oppressive consequences, particularly for women, particularly for minorities, particularly for uh, gays and lesbians um, and you know we, we see case studies out there in state laboratories Texas being one of them you know Alabama Mississippi Louisiana the old Confederacy you we, we see places where uh, you know if if they had their druthers and there wasn't a federal overseer um, not much would would have changed since uh, before the Civil War well, let's look at another thing. We, it, it, in our, one of our presidential candidates, Ted Cruz, right now, right? I remember there was an interview where, where Ted Cruz was sitting next to his father, and his father says that atheists should be put in concentration camps behind razor wire. What did Ted Cruz say to correct or, or put a leash on his dad? Of course, nothing. So this, to me, is, is, uh, is, is complicit. Well, and he says, I, I believe it was Ted Cruz who said that you can't be an effective commander in chief if you don't start your day every day on your knees. Um, this is this is typical of the GOP field for the presidency that there is this idea of religious privilege whereby all you have to say is I'm a Christian and people will presume a set of values. Honesty uh, trustworthiness, uh, compassion. Well, when do we have demonstrated. I mean. <laughs> That's the, the the point is that that none of those things necessarily come along with being a Christian. What does come along with being a Christian is uh, you know a, a belief in certain things, a going maybe going to a church. Now though that's what what th those are the details that make up a Christian life. We don't necessarily know if you have. The, this set of really humanist values that you you like to think maybe you know goes along with a religious point of view, but we've seen over and over again that doesn't necessarily. And the the sad part for me is that the news media allows the shorthand to exist without challenging it. You know why why would um, you, 
these candidates be able to just simply claim religious convictions and then be presumed to have uh, the best traits of humankind. It's, there, there's no reason for it and there needs to be some pushback. Not only because it's simply not true that being a Christian means that you're trustworthy and compassionate, but it, it suggests that if you are not a Christian, if you're not religious, that you don't hold those values, that, you don't, that you're not necessarily as ethical or as moral as somebody who claims to have a religious conviction. Completely ridiculous. Yes, and in fact, if you, if you look, you know, Phil Zuckerman has done um, cross-national studies to correlate religiosity with, uh, with happiness, human happiness, and human progress. And his studies basically show that the more secular a society is, the more compassionate it is. I don't the think it's just his it, study. We, we, we've seen lots of, of, of different polls in different countries that the more secular a country is, you know, like the Scandinavian countries are being a primary example of this, you know, the more peaceful they tend to be, the lower the rates of violent crime in particular. And within the United States, if you look at the most religious areas here, like Louisiana, for example, like the most religious state has the highest uh, murder rate, in, or at least it did in one year. I think Chicago took over after that. But in general, we see that the, the higher the religiosity, the lower the, the rates of uh, education, and the, the higher the rates of violent crime, and, and, and the higher the rates of teen pregnancy and abortion and divorce and, and, divorce and, and every other statistic that they, that they want to argue would not be the case if religion had dominance there. And there was a brilliant thing about uh, about Mississippi being, there's a video out about Mississippi being both the poorest state and the most conservative state. That was hosted on Bill Maher. Great example of that. That uh, the whenever religion does have influence over the government, it, it does exactly the opposite of what it advertises that it would do. So I didn't mean to talk about all of that while we <laughs> had you on. I would like to know uh, what what are you in what are you involved with? What are your goals as you take on CFI and uh, your other projects? And at this point. So let me talk a little about the Richard Dawkins Foundation because I've been involved with the work of the foundation for the last two years. Uh, we've done some really remarkable things in that short period, period of time. Um, along with the, uh, a few other groups, we launched the Openly Secular campaign. So Openly Secular is a, uh, something that many groups have done in one guise or another, which is urging non-believers to come forward and be true to who they are because it's the best way to reduce um, hostility and stigmatization. You know, look, we know that gays and lesbians have been able to overcome uh, incredible bias in society in a generation or a generation and a half by saying to their friends, neighbors, loved ones, coworkers, this is who I am. Uh, if you thought I was a good moral person before you knew this about me, you should, you should maintain that opinion of me. And it worked. It worked beautifully. I think atheists and secular people can accomplish the same uh, result in a much shorter period of time. We are teed up to do it. We are a rising force in the American electorate. Uh, more and more people are coming forward as secular. And the Openly Secular campaign is gathering up videos of average people being open about who they are but also celebrities. So some of our biggest celebrities, uh, Julia Sweeney, Bill Maher, Penn and Teller, sure, you know, we already know that they're, that they're non-believers, but maybe, you know, the rest of the world needs to know that Julia Sweeney, one America's sweetheart, is, a, is an open atheist. Um, but we also got, uh, uh, we also got a, a, a famous uh, National Football League player to come forward and, be openly secular. Um, we were able to get John Davidson, who was the heartthrob in the 80s, uh, who actually had a dinner theater in Branson, Missouri, whose parents were Baptist ministers to come forward as openly secular. So uh, we, we, I think the, the attention that gets generated around the celebrities is, is a big deal. 
and it's I think the 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 key to really making our point to the wider world. I think what we, I, want to, I want to throw something out here to, for people who don't don't understand secular. Secular being distinct from atheist. I mean, secular is when you believe that the policies mandated by government should be done independent of religion, and that so that our, our founding fathers, regardless what their religious beliefs may have been, some of them deists, some of them marginal Christians of one type or another, they believe that the government should not use religion as their, as their guide; should be independent of that. Am I? Are we on the same page there? That is the technical definition of secular. I will say that the non-believing community and the non-religious community has been using the term secular as a kind of um, umbrella term that everyone could subscribe to. You know, one of the ways in which we as a community have divided ourselves in the past has been around what to call ourselves. So, you know, you have the atheists, the humanists, the skeptics, free thinkers, brights, I mean, you know, every name under the sun, often because the word atheist has a pejorative uh, And I want to speak to that real quick because I was an atheist for 15 years without realizing it because I bought into the lie about, you know, that, that what an atheist is. I was told that an atheist was somebody who knows that there's no God or that an atheist is somebody who believes in nothing as if some kind of Zen Buddhism thing applied to atheism somehow. But eventually what I came to realize is that if you're not convinced that an actual deity really exists, then you're atheist. And it doesn't yeah. matter if you want to call yourself agnostic. You can be agnostic too. But if you're if, again, if you're if you lack that conviction, and I've had a friend, a dear friend of mine, one of my oldest friends, in fact, who said, "Well, I'm not convinced that there's a God, but I'm not convinced there's not one either." And I said, that's, "That's absurd. That still means that you're not convinced that there's a God. That still means that you're atheist." And he hates the A word so much that he won't wear it. But you know, it's kind of like Neil deGrasse Tyson. He knows what the word means. He just doesn't like it. It goes back to uh, connecting atheists to the Soviet Union and communism. I, I think that connection uh, helped to doom the word. Uh, but look, our community needs to own that word. Just like gays and lesbians owned queer at one point, they just said, you know what? It, it's not an insult. We are, that's what we are. Um, I'm, I'm a proud atheist. But the word secular has is a little more encompass, encompassing more people are willing to subscribe to it. Technically, it means exactly as you described, which is that to keep religion out of a civic authority. But generally, it's been used within the non-believing community as a, a term to describe us. We are non-believers, we are non-religious. Um, so you have the Secular Student Alliance and you have the Secular Coalition for America. Secular Student Alliance has student groups around the country. The Secular Coalition for America is the lobbyist arm of the non-religious community. And these they use the, the term in order to draw in the broader community and not, you know, not have the people like your friend say, you know, that's not me. They're not speaking for me because I don't, agree to label myself with the A word. Um, so anyway, we did, we have this wonderful openly secular campaign. It's going gangbusters, really. And then we, we launched something called the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. So believe it or not, 43% of Americans tell, uh, tell pollsters that human beings arrived on this earth fully formed within the last 10,000 years. So more than, four than, more than four in 10 Americans do not subscribe to human evolution. That's a problem of education. Yeah, and it's and a huge one. It's a huge problem. Last year was the 90th anniversary of the Scopes Monkey Trial, and we are still fighting that battle. There are plenty of schools where maybe creation is not taught in science class, but neither is evolution. So what we decided was, one of the reasons that evolution is not taught in middle school is that middle school teachers don't have the knowledge, tools, or confidence to do so. And so we have been holding workshops, full day professional development workshops for middle school science teachers around the country to learn how to teach evolution and to prepare them for the questions that come their way.
Now, if I may plug myself right there, I mean, I've, and we've talked about this before. My wife and I do a series of middle school and high school science lessons teaching biology, wherein we do include evolutionary lessons. And these are according to the next generation science standards. So it's a national science standards. And this, my, my, my wife was a, uh, was a curriculum specialist on this subject. So just wanted to throw out that plug. It, it's on living science uh, videos on YouTube if you want to check it out. There, I'm done. That's great. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to link to that from our website. Uh, we, we have richarddawkins.net slash ties, Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. Uh, we have uh, PowerPoints, resources, labs, uh, model tests, et cetera, that's, that are available to teachers or whomever. Uh, Bertha Vasquez is the director of ties. And she, uh, last year she did a webinar, 200 teachers signed up for it. She'll be doing uh, many more to come. And we have, we've already had one, we had a workshop in Texas, in fact, in January, uh, in San, uh, San Juan, Texas. And, uh, you know, we were, we're focusing on the South if we can. Well, the South needs a whole lot of attention, I can tell you that. Uh, you were also involved in some way with the upcoming Reason Rally? We are a major sponsor. I say we, um, the Richard Dawkins Foundation and the Center for Inquiry, both are major sponsors of the Reason Rally. For your listeners, uh, that will take place June 4th uh, in front of the Lincoln Memorial. It's a very exciting. Uh, the program right now is being pulled together. I don't want to steal the thunder of any announcements, so I won't be saying who has been uh, confirmed, but it's going to be incredible, and there are going to be some really big name people. Uh, Richard Dawkins, I can I can at least offer that uh, he will be there for sure. And uh, it, you know, last time in 2012, it was there were 30,000 people who came out in the rain for a fantastic day. This year, the weather's definitely going to be better. It's in June, and uh, we expect even even bigger crowds. So I hope everyone who's who's watching this makes books their flight, books their ticket, books books their bus passage to Washington D.C. for June fourth. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to. I was at the last one, and that was an an incredible event. Of course, it was on the National Mall. How how would you do it on the the the, the Lincoln Memorial? Yeah, this sure. Is, this well, is going to be where uh, 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 Martin Luther King stood. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> There's some of the other things that the Richard Dawkins Foundation is doing. Um, we get letters all the time from people who say that the videos on YouTube have changed their life. You know, it's a lifeline for them. They have doubts. They don't know where to go. They go to the Richard Dawkins channel on YouTube, and uh, they just watch it in a, you know, day-long um, enlightenment session, if you will. I have to well, tell you, the last time I saw Richard Dawkins, I, I told him that it was the first time I'd ever seen a video of him where he was giving a presentation on uh, the halibut or the, the flounder, you know, talk about how it develops as a symmetrical fish and that at some point it, 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 you know, it moves over and the both eyes move to one side of the head as it turns into this flat bottom feeder. And I said, well, when I watched this video, of how he's explaining how evolution works and how is how this is not an intel you know any, any kind of an indication of intelligent design how this is clearly evolutionary and that's all that it can be i remember thinking that's what i want to do i want to do what that guy does and i i'm proud to say that that's what i do now but yeah. the, he was the inspiration for that and i'm really happy that that's what i'm doing there are so many people who come up to him at book signings and to have it almost the exact same story it's amazing how many scientists have been inspired by Richard Dawkins and, and really gratifying. But, but when I, what I was going to say to you is because the letters that we get are from English speakers because our videos are only in English, we are now subtitling our videos into other languages. And we have a team, around, we have a team of volunteers around the world, literally, of, of speakers in Farsi and Arabic and Spanish and Portuguese and French. I mean, we, we're, we're trying to focus on the languages spoken in the Muslim world and make our video library available to native lang language speakers in the Muslim world. Well, I've, I met a few uh, brilliant people 
in the in the, in the Muslim world who are a little a little less than impressed by the religion that they've been sold. So there there's definitely a market there. Before we close up, I'd like to ask one more question. What what do you personally see as a goal for what you're doing now? What would you like to accomplish before this is all over? You're part of it. Well, I, I hope to get uh, an atheist elected to public office. We are 501c3, NCFI is a 501c3, so we're not going to be doing any actual electioneering. But if we can lay the groundwork for secular people to have a place at the public policy table, for it not to be an automatic exclusion to elective office, then we will have done our job. Likewise, as a representative of American Atheist, I also can't tell people, you know, I, I can't advocate a particular candidate, however strongly I may feel about it. I, I, I share your frustration there. It's a funny thing that, that the churches have this tax-exempt status because they're not supposed to act as lobbyists and they're not supposed to direct their con congregations in how to vote. But that is exactly what many of them do. Well, you know, there's a, there's a loophole for education and education on political issues. And in some ways, we'll be using that loophole, too. Okay. Robin, it's been, it's been brilliant. Uh, thank you for being on the show. You've been a very good interview. I'm going to go ahead and let you go in and end this broadcast. But as I said, I've got some things to talk, you about, talk to you about as far as legal proceedings and so forth afterward. So everyone, good night. Thank you for paying attention to the raw man.